Hello and welcome to the Schumann Files. I'm your host, Kelly Agathos, and today we're talking about climate change, what the EU is trying to do about it, and how it's going so far. Well, everybody, I hate to break it to you, but the climate is completely, what's the word here? Fucked. It's either too hot, too stormy, too windy, or too floody. I mean, this was Greece last summer. Remember the days when people could travel to a hot Greek island simply to marry the love of their life and find out which of these three men was their real dad? Good times. Anyway, it seems like we should be doing something about climate change. And here in Europe, we have the European Green Deal. Now, this Green Deal isn't about scoring cheap weed in Amsterdam. It's actually a package of legislation aimed at combating climate change and getting Europe to carbon neutrality by 2050. Think about it as an environmental horn of plenty, featuring an abundance of laws regulating everything from batteries to petrol cars to cowgirls. And at the same time as it saves our environment, the Green Deal also promises to save the European economy by creating lots of new jobs. Unfortunately, just like a Tinder profile, reality seldom matches the fantasy. Because just after the Green Deal was announced, life had other plans for us. Thanks to COVID and the war in Ukraine, instead of focusing on saving the planet, we had to choose between paying for our gas bills or our therapist. But despite these setbacks, the EU has approved very ambitious emission reduction targets, passed laws to promote the use of cleaner fuels in the transport sector, and the biggest victory of all, we banned plastic straws. Yes, we did it. Little Turtle's nostrils have been saved. Unfortunately, plastic straws only account for an estimated 0.2% of total plastic waste. And what's even worse, only 0.1% of baby turtles reach the sea and survive. Run, little Donatello, run for your life. Now, some say these new green laws, much like baby turtles, don't go far enough. But the truth is, even these relative green victories are becoming harder and harder to come by. Why? Well, it all comes down to shifting political calculations and aggressive industry lobbying, or what decision makers in Brussels call foreplay. Take what happened with the sustainable use regulation, for example. This proposal was meant to reduce the use of certain chemical pesticides in the EU. Turns out, not only do they cause environmental degradation, but they've also been linked to several diseases and even cancer. Nevertheless, agribusiness lobbyists and conservative lawmakers managed to get the bill scrapped altogether. I mean, who doesn't want a side of cancer with their fruit salad? And even when the Green Deal's lofty ambitions have resulted in a win, that win has been greatly compromised, like what happened with the nature restoration law. In the beginning, Supporting it seemed like a no-brainer. It sought to restore Europe's degraded ecosystems like forests, wetlands, and oceans. Because nature deserves some restoration too. Screw those neoclassical buildings. Mother Nature needs a spa day. But unfortunately, conservative groups in the European Parliament called to reject this law altogether, arguing that it threatened food security, the livelihood of farmers, and other industries. The law eventually passed, but in a much less ambitious form, and most of the rules applying to farmers were scrapped or severely weakened. In fact, enforcement was so watered down that it became less a nature restoration law and more of a nature restoration suggestion. Well, to understand what is at play politically, I met with member of the European Parliament Christine Schneider. Schneider is a German politician that belongs to the European People's Party, the main right-wing group and also the largest political party in the European Parliament. And she has worked hard with her colleagues to get the Green Deal, let's say, adjusted to the party line. I asked her why her party pushed back on the nature restoration law. We didn't push it back. Uh, we push it in the right way so that it can function. Oh, I see. You got it in the right direction. No, in, in the right direction that it can function, not in that direction you think about it. So what's the problem? Why are we stalling? We have to take them all on board. Take what on board? The industry and the business. We have all to take it on board. I mean, we're over-consuming as it is. Couldn't we just eat 10% less? Yeah, but 
I think it's not the right way that we depend uh, from fruit production out of third countries where we cannot influence the conditions and where we cannot influence if they produce it in the right way with our nature. In the right way? <laughs> Is the European Green Deal dead? No. Is it on life support? I think now the Commission is on the correct direction. We have to look how the Green Deal can work with our industry or with our farmers. So they are on the right way now. Right. Now, it's worth saying that 3,000 scientists signed a letter saying that the arguments related to food security and farmland had no scientific evidence. And environmental activists and journalists have accused the European People's Party of aligning too closely with big agri and farmers' interests. But it's not just the nerds and the tree huggers who are defending the Green Deal. They're serious people too. Part of European industry is very much on board the green train. So I met with green industry lobbyist Ellen Hoff to find out if we can save the planet without going back to the Stone Age or put farmers out of a job. Is the Green Deal going to hurt business? It's going to hurt certain businesses. Businesses that are very heavily dependent on fossil fuels and it's okay to make them hurt? I just think that they can be replaced by other businesses um, that can really help us in the transition towards more sustainability, and they are going to thrive. So we're just going to have new businesses. It's basically a shift that we're going through. But what about the jobs? Isn't this going to mean that some people are out of a job and then you've got to get a new job? You know how hard it is when you have to reapply, especially if you're not young anymore. It's true, and we are definitely also concerned about that, but we're going to like these new businesses are also requiring a lot of jobs. So a lot of people working there. So we will still have jobs. Okay, so you win some, you lose some. Yes. Why should our industries in Europe basically have higher standards and compete globally with other industries that don't really care? It's like we've got one arm tied behind our back and we have to fight in the ring with them? That's not fair. Yeah, that but would be a fair fight. It's, uh, it's also a disbelief that sustainability means that you can be competitive. There are plenty of cases out there that show that you can be very competitive and very sustainable at the same time. But even though people like Ellen say the measures outlined in the Green Deal are achievable, many are still opposed to them. In fact, industry lobbying and political infighting over green policies greatly affect national interests and make agreement at European level even harder to reach. Take the Netherlands, for example. The government tried to implement a European directive on reducing nitrogen emissions in the agricultural sector, or, in layman's terms, massively cut down on cow shit. This prompted Dutch farmers to lose their shit and hold demonstrations for months. Ultimately, this resulted in an electoral shitstorm in which far-right politician and movie villain hair model Heert Wilders got the majority of the Dutch vote. Whilst Wilders is most well known for his anti-immigration rhetoric, He's also very critical of green policies. And during the Dutch national election, he defeated the architect of the Green Deal himself, Social Democrat Franz Timmermans, who will now go on to pursue a career as Santa Claus. <laughs> and it's not just the Dutch. Earlier in the year, the German government ruffled quite a few feathers in Brussels with their last minute attempt to change a law forbidding the sale of new combustion engine cars starting in 2035. Well, as the saying goes, Never ask a German about his car, his boiler, or why his grandpa moved to Argentina in 1945. In short, national politicians all over Europe are afraid of the political cost of supporting ambitious green targets. So many of them are campaigning against more eco-friendly policies to avoid hurting businesses in the short term and make sure they keep getting elected. It's not easy being green. It sure isn't, Kermit. So what's the takeaway? Well, just like my New Year's resolution, the European Green Deal was full of good intentions. But at the end of the day, I still don't own a gym bag, and neither my abs nor Europe has seen any real results. But I don't want the planet to burn. I want to save more baby turtles, and I want six-pack abs, goddammit! I want us to get through summers without melting or drowning, and more than anything, I want Europe to lead the way with our intelligence, compassion, resourcefulness. I mean, we kind of got the world into this mess by kickstarting the Industrial Revolution in the first place. And don't get me wrong, we got amazing things out of it, like mass transit, electricity, vibrators. 
but we also boiled the atmosphere. So let's get our shit together. One big opportunity to make your voice heard is during the next European elections between the 6th and 9th of June 2024. So get out and vote, and when voting, make sure you ask yourself whose interests your candidate is looking out for. Until then, get on board the green train and keep sucking on paper straws, people. Guys, can I get a new one?